Artificial intelligence is remaking marketing as we speak, and if you're a marketer you can either get up to speed or get left behind. The choice is yours and, really, it's a no-brainer. Join Jeff Livingston and Greg Verdino as they explore the latest AI news, trends, tools, and ideas that are creating the future of marketing today. This is No Brainer, an AI podcast for marketers. Oh, and just in case you're wondering, yes, I am an AI. Take it away, Jeff and Greg. Hey, everybody. This is Greg Verdino. It is a new year, a new season of No Brainer, an AI podcast for marketers. And I am here, as always, with my partner, my good friend, my evil twin, Jeff Livingston. How you doing, Jeff? Great. Good to see you, Greg. We have some exciting news of our own. Uh, we've merged paths. We put out a separate announcement on our feeds. I hope you check it out. We're creating a research and advisory firm called Cognitive Path to Serve Marketers with Technology Intel. No brainer, of course, nicely fits into that where we can have a uh, active dialogue about the stuff that's happened in the news and do so in a manner it's a little bit, a uh, little less canned, if you would, or formal. Uh, but with that, I hope you do check it out, cognitivepath.com. Enough about us, man. Let's get down to some AI news. Yeah, absolutely. And there has been a lot of news. You would think that things might have slowed down. And I guess they did a little bit over the holidays. But of course, when we hit the new year, we hit January and we go right into CES season. And of course, a lot of marketers are eager to understand what all of the different announcements coming out of CES mean for them. Of course, anybody that's been around for a while knows there's plenty of stuff that gets announced at CES that's pure vaporware. Uh, it's just, you know, stuff that gets gets you know, announced. Companies have to say something, so they say something. They're looking to show off. They're looking to make a mess. And, um, you know, and, and, and they, they, they get their announcements out. But of course, there are some legitimate things. And I think if you look at all of the news coming out of the show and you start to kind of cluster it and make sense of the patterns, you do start to get a sense of what some of the key trends for AI are going to be in the coming year. And of course, as we are uh, prone to do on this show, we can then start to put it into context for marketers. Uh, today, by the way, for anybody who's listening to this, when we release the show is January 15th. It's Martin Luther King Day. We are recording at, oh, I don't know, nine o'clock or so in the morning. So anything that changes between now and when you're listening to this show, we're not responsible for. But as of right <laughs> now, this is what we're thinking. This is what we're seeing. And we and are talking ready. to you, open AI. Absolutely. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, so Jeff, why don't you kick us off? What's the first set of things that caught your eye coming out of the show? Yeah. Well, first of all, CES, as you know, again, the largest technology show in the United States, more than 100,000 people come every year to Vegas. It, it's actually where I started my career way back when uh, they had dinosaurs walking around with like little phones and all that stuff. All jokes aside, but no, Guns N' Roses was a, in its original incarnation of walking around the show when I started. So it, it was a while ago and it was really cool. Um, and it's still cool. The thing that they were talking about more than anything going into the show was AI, and the show didn't disappoint. Right out of the gate, we had a big announcement from Volkswagen integrating GPT. And I think one of the things that matters with this show in particular is it's really a hardware show more than anything. Um, it's all about the devices you're buying, uh, whether that's for your bathroom, your kitchen, uh, all the electronics around your home, the smart home, if you remember that whole thing office technology, uh, TVs, automobiles, everything you can buy as an individual or as a business. And so uh, software drives hardware, and that's why it matters that AI is a big topic. And vendors integrating AI or more in particular, ChatGPT or some LLM into their product was huge. So basically now we have Volkswagens, which are going to have people to, uh, driving distracted while they talk to <laughs> Siri, uh, interfacing with ChatGPT. We had Utopia e-bikes. Again, that's even scarier to me, you know, <laughs> like, okay, I'm going to talk to my bike while I'm, you know, oh, Oh, look at how I missed the red light. <laughs> you know, dead drivers everywhere. Uh, we had sunglasses. Uh, I think I saw a toilet. 
that was announced with ChatGPT integrated to it, which is also disturbing and for different reasons. I hope you're not training the AI while you're on the toilet. Um, <laughs> I actually you know. think it was uh, <laughs> Alexa and uh, whatever Google's thing is called, but it just as scary, right? Just right. As scary. Just as scary, right? You know, now you I mean, can talk to your toilet. Exactly. And, and, you know, some of these things are going to fail, and that definitely happens every year out at CES where you get these like, lampooned almost sharper image types of products that are kind of novelties that disappear uh but what it really means is that from a sheer news value integration is going to lose importance right like one of the things that we've seen over the past years i can announce that we've integrated chat gpt and it's big right or i've you know launched a bot that interfaces with my website and it's big and i think what's happened is a chat bot has now become something where it's a private instance or a direct pipeline to an LLM, it, it, it doesn't really matter very much anymore. It's kind of becoming the new social media comment box. For Even though Volkswagen got a ton of coverage out of that, all the other vendors did not. And so you literally had dozens and dozens of vendors announcing these integrations and not getting traction from it. And, and to me, I thought that that was notable, right? It was like a lot of trees falling in the forest without anybody noticing. And so I think the real trick now for companies is, am I announcing that I've integrated an AI or am I announcing something that's useful to the customer and why, right? And if there's some sort of a value set, some sort of a new feature, is it just a feature that supports the larger product or service or solution as opposed to, Hey, we have AI. So what? Welcome to the 2020s. <laughs> right. I think you've, you've hit on a few things. I think as much as companies like to announce things around CES, it is such a PR nightmare because everyone's announcing things, right? That's one of the lessons you learn early, I think, in your career in communications is, you know, you don't necessarily want to announce around CES because you're going to get drowned out in the noise. And there might be that factor as well. If, if you know, Volkswagen announced first, everyone that came after you know, kind of missed their chance to be that first early announcement that would get all the attention, all the hype and and whatnot. And there were some other things that got hype. Let's be, let's be fair about that. But, you know, I think, you know, I'm a lot so of excited for my switch too. <laughs> right. You know, but a lot of these, you know, I think if, you know, Volkswagen made a big announcement, if you were the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the 10th car company to say we're integrating AI. And if it mm. sounded the same, who cares at that point? Um, I, but I think that there are a few other things, right? I think that, if 2023 was the year that every software company felt compelled, they had the pressure on them to say and show that they were integrating AI into their solution. And that's absolutely what we saw in 2023. Everybody had an AI feature or function on their roadmap all of a sudden. Um, now, this is the year we're seeing the hardware companies effectively catch up and, and make those same kinds of announcements. Um, and you're right that there is going to be a, I think, a gap between what these organizations are doing and what their customers actually care about. Mm. And I think that's important because there, you know, this was true of software as well, that they're so eager to announce that they are on the AI hype train that it seems to me there isn't always sort of constructive, critical consideration about whether or not the customer is going to find value in the feature or the functionality. Uh, beyond that, though, I think there is something bigger going on, which we're starting to see sort of the first baby steps into, which is that AI will be everywhere. It's kind of, this is almost like the embodiment of AI. You know, we think about robots, and I, I think in the show we'll probably touch on robots, but at the end of the day, you know, every, every physical object that is connected to the internet is going to have some form of AI integration integrated into it. And I think we're beginning to see, you know, what that might look like, or at least in terms of the press releases, as opposed to the practical applications in the real world, we're beginning to see what that might look like when a car has an integrated uh, generative AI model of some kind, when sunglasses have, when a bike has, when a toilet has. 
And yeah. I think we're also starting to see kind of, you know, again, we're beginning to turn that that point, you know, turn that corner from the computer or the or the technology, more broadly, technology interfaces that we've effectively grown up with, right? The, you know, com- fingers on a keyboard, et cetera, et cetera, mm. um, into a whole new way of interacting with the devices in our lives. I uh, think that's, be- that's a great point, right? Like right. that's the humanization point, right? Where now technology becomes more central to us. I, I think uh, Accenture talked about that a little bit with their report as well. Yeah. And that, you know, it's now you have a conversation with your device, a conversation with your car, a conversation with your bike, a it's, conversation it's her, with your right? Pole, right. It becomes her. Um, although hopefully We're referencing not, a movie, terribly, by the way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I think that, you know, it's, it's, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's where it's going. I think the other thing is, you know, technology really takes off when it becomes invisible. I right? agree. You know, yeah. so to an extent, I guess, to the extent that a lot of these companies announce things and nobody paid attention, uh, maybe that is the first sign that this technology, even as early as it is from a generative AI standpoint, in terms of its sort of mainstreaming, that the technology is already starting to become a little bit invisible and Mm. that you don't need to think about, you know, does my car have generative AI, but instead you'll be able to just get in the car and interact with it in a whole new way. And it will feel natural. It'll feel normal and it'll just be that way. And that's when this technology really becomes fully ingrained into the way we live. Right. And I think actually that's a good segue to our second trend, which was that, uh, I, if there was any particular area of electronics that seems to be leading the way in the integration, it was automobiles, right? right. I mean, we yeah. saw Volkswagen and Sony and Honda and Microsoft uh, talk about it. NVIDIA had a, a an auto-specific announcement. Bosch talked about putting eye tracking into your mirrors, which I think uh, every insurance company was like, Ooh, we're going to nail those bastards, man. They're well, totally you distracted. Know, the, the you know, Bosch, and that has its own yeah. big brother implications. Right. And, and yeah, like the, the Bosch thing in particular with eye tracking was, is one of those announcements, you know, not to kind of carp or harp on, you know, the, the problem with CES and the pressure to announce something here right. coupled with the pressure to say we're doing AI is it's one of those announcements that to me sounded like, you know, at face value, you're like, oh, cool, eye tracking. That makes sense. But when you actually dug down a layer deeper and you looked at the it was creepy, applications right? and applications, right? So one thing that they, they kind of talked about was, you know, it'll recognize whether your eyes are tired and ask if they, you know, if you want the body coffee machine to put an espresso on for when you get home it's like if your eyes are tired um it's probably late at night do you really want espresso right that made no (laughs) sense and then this idea of eye tracking you know kind of you know essentially attention tracking right which sounds like oh cool you know you know the car will know whether you're paying attention to the road but you know to your point what are the implications of that is there a marketing implication like if if i if my eyes drift over to the mcdonald's sign like is bosch selling data to mcdonald's then you know i'll get just in time geofenced advertising now saying hey you know here's an offer or to your point are they selling data to insurance companies right now all of a sudden you've got big brother tracking your 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 um you know your your the extent to which you're paying attention to the road and it becomes you know potentially very problematic especially and i don't know if everybody saw this announcement towards the end of last year when right. you consider like walgreens has been banned from using facial recognition in their stores for five years because they were using it irresponsibly but there are also positive benefits too for example let's say you fall asleep at the wheel and the car automatically pulls over and shuts down or the car detects that you're drunk (laughs) Right. What's ironic, though, is those were not those to me are far more compelling use cases that they did not talk about. No, they They were too busy selling espresso, which is just stupid. Right. It's just stupid. Mm -hmm. And and so all those use cases didn't help. You know, it it really needed to get down to smart marketing. It wasn't uh, like, well, you and I this past week had a conversation about the four P's and the value of product marketing and how marketers really don't have control over product marketing. So whoever did the product marketing on that, whether it was the marketing team or the 
product team at the boss side yeah. kind of had a fall down. Yeah. You know, and I think even I think about the Sony announcement too, and for um, folk, you know, we'll of course link to all these things in the show notes, but you know, the Sony announcement, essentially Sony announced that it will be partnering with Honda and Microsoft, which is an interesting partnership. I don't know that Sony and Microsoft have ever partnered. Uh, but it, um, yeah, they, I mean, they've competed quite a right. bit, it's in, you know, but they, you know, right, exactly that they're, you know, they're partnering to, um, introduce or design a new vehicle, right? So it'll be a Honda vehicle designed by Sony running on Microsoft technology for AI in particular, um, but when you read the announcement, it really hypes the fact that the car is going to be like all geeked out for gamers. Right. Um, now, Sony. So is it going to be a PlayStation game or an Xbox game? Right. Which is another thing, right? That's the Sony versus Microsoft thing. But like, how distracting would that be to have a car that has all of this gaming functionality baked into it? And you've got to drive the damn thing, right? Although you and I are both parents. We both know the value so long as it's in the backseat of right. a pair of headphones. There it is. <laughs> yeah, so it's another one of those things where you start to question, is this practical? But I think from the standpoint of AI, which, of course, is the focus of our show, what's interesting here is I didn't see them hyping generative AI specifically. Right. So much it was as more the, talking about the integration of AI in general. And I don't think they got very specific about exactly what the AI features and functionality in the vehicle would be. Um, but I got the sense that it was broader than just chat with your car. And that's where NVIDIA gets really interesting because when you look at the announcements they've made around automotive specifically, um, it goes beyond just GPUs for running chat applications. Sure. And they really, they really go, you know, their announcements go deep in the direction of the use of AI through the entire automotive life cycle from design to manufacturing to interaction and ownership. And I think ultimately that's where things are going to head. Of course, I mean, of course there's plenty of, you know, sort of technology in cars today and AI is already used in vehicles for, you know, everything from, you know, well, from, that's the other thing is AI is already present in vehicles. Right. I mean, anybody that's got the mirrors that alert you and when somebody is near you on your left or right. right in your blind spot already knows that. Right. Right. So here what you're seeing is NVIDIA essentially not to mention not, automated driving, you know. Right. And right. And 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 as those things become more and more prevalent, more and more popular, as the technology becomes more and more sophisticated, you've got NVIDIA who's already established a key clear leadership position in generative AI because they manufacture those GPUs, uh, basically saying we're going to take an ownership position in advancing the sophistication of Artificial well, intelligence in automotive, which I think does, is interesting. It does occur to me while talking about this that one of the things that may be happening with this larger trend is, just hypothetically speaking, and again, and I'm just kind of riffing a little bit here, but you know, if you think about the way automated driving is moving, and in spite of all the fear about it, it's becoming a mature technology to the point where we're talking about automated trucking, right. et cetera, then literally the human in the vehicle, where regardless of C, if we are dealing with a uh, an AI driver, is literally there as the human in the loop. And they do right. need to be entertained. Otherwise, they're going to be drooling on themselves right. like, you yeah. know, 20, 30 minutes. And so what we're seeing is perhaps – the early stages of literally turning the automobile into a, a massive entertainment vehicle. Yeah. Like basically it's a mini home theater right. to entertain you regardless of what you're doing as you are transported by your device across the town, across the state, across the province, wherever you may be to wherever you may be going. And, and yes, in, in that great. sense, this makes a lot of sense. You know, it, it really moves yeah. us forward. Absolutely. And, you know, Sony, it's funny because Sony announced, I don't know if it was the same car or a similar car years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember that because I was speaking at a conference for another automotive company and 
Um, I use that as an example. And I was talking about essentially the same thing you're talking about now is that in a future where cars are more reliably automated, you know, are self-driving or self-sufficient in a way um, that the automobile becomes a very different kind of device, right? It becomes essentially a third place in the way it isn't today, where it can be your office on wheels and entertainment center, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a little bit silly right now because, we're nowhere near that point. Uh, but clearly, you know, when you look at these announcements around automotive, you can see that that's the direction that these companies are pointed. How long it takes us to get there, of course, is going to be another story. hundred percent, hundred percent. So another thing that kind of uh, you highlighted a little bit with like, can I make you a coffee kind of a thing is this interaction between human and uh, AI, a little more than just a, a chatting bot. And so this is the rise of the AI agent, which is right. an often discussed technology. Yeah. You know, Before, I, I kind of, you know, I don't know where chat GPT is an agent or a chat bot, depending on how your perspective is or how you basically tune the algorithm uh, for your device. But, you know, Accenture brought this up, the humanizing of, of AI, the, the ability for us to interact with these devices. And we saw several announcements like this rabbit R1 personalized agent, which is, got some problems with the uh, i think with the way it's been developed uh but also you have the samsung bally bot and then the lg robot uh the alexa assistant that's been developed uh so basically uh, the rival of the agent whether it's embodied in a physical robot a physical device uh whether it's embodied in your toilet or your barbecue or whatever it is basically we have these agents that are interacting with us uh, and the hype's very big on it. Now, it, before I hand it over to you, I mean, there are a couple of things I, I really wanted to hit on this one, which is uh, one, uh, hype's really high on it, but technology really sucks on it. I mean, I actually think that Siri and Alexa are further along on this than the actual LLMs. Now, whether or not they merge those algorithms and the more complex models to deliver this, whether LOMs continue to advance so that they can deliver this. I, I'm not sure how that works. I'm not a data scientist, but I do know that where we are today, I, I see expectations should probably be pretty low. And like most CESs, we should see some robots launch that are going to completely bomb. Now, anybody that's seen Rocky Three back from the like freaking 80s with Mr. T, um, you know, it's Clubber Lane. There were robots in that, and they failed too. So this is not a new thing. They keep failing. Uh, now, we're probably closer to them working, but I don't expect this iteration to necessarily be the huge winner unless they can upgrade uh, massively. The Rabbit one in particular I want to raise because I thought this was another big, huge fail from a product marketing standpoint. Why do I need to carry my AI agent when I got my watch and I got my phone? I mean, that is just crazy. Are you asking me to carry a third a third device around so I can interact with my AI? I already have Siri on my phone. I already have ChatGPT on my phone. I can have a whole plethora of AI apps on my phone. It makes no sense to me why you would launch a separate device and sell it for $200. I, I didn't understand why they didn't just develop an app. Well, you know, I think it's the good news is that Rabbit is cheaper than the humane pin, <laughs> which hmm. essentially is the same kind of idea as a standalone device for interacting with artificial intelligence. And I agree with you 100%. I don't know why certain companies are hell bent on introducing an additional device into our lifestyle at a point when that, that new device adds especially at a point when that device adds at best questionable value to our lifestyle um you know so and i think that's the big criticism that rabbit has gotten it's interesting because they sold was it 10 or 20,000 units they sold out two um pre-order runs and i don't know the way it was reported i couldn't tell if that was a total of 10,000 or a tour two runs of 10,000 each it was hard to understand the article i read about it so you know of course i mean 20,000 devices is nothing in the grand scheme of things right they got a ton of hype around the show um and there's of course you know 
20,000 geeks in the United States of America, and they were all at CES. So I'm not surprised they sold that kind of uh, volume so quickly. So you got to give them credit for that because they've certainly funded a production run, if nothing else. Uh, right. But that's, you know, I don't anticipate that this is a device that's going to sell millions upon millions of, of, um, of, of, of copies, right? It's um, like, do you remember that video camera that people have with the USB report where they, all the bloggers took it to the right, blogging yeah. conferences? Yeah, the, um, the, the, not the Go Cam. It was, uh, it, it was something, something like, like that. Like the, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? It was yeah. the size of a phone and people had both, right? It right. was crazy. And then finally the phone technology caught up where right. the camera yeah. was good enough that there was no, there was no use in having it. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, so, you know, I think the device angle is problematic. I think what's interesting, you know, the argument about AI or the I guess the logic around AI agents is that today, large language models or assistants, chatbots, whatever, running on large language models are only capable to a point when you actually want it to do something, right? Um, that you can't give a general direction and have it autonomously complete a task for you. Right. Um, and that what, you know, what, and what a, a device like Rabbit, we're talking about as if everybody's read this, but basically Rabbit is this sort of weird rectangular thing. It almost looks like an old Nintendo um game boy in a way it's very retro looking and um it allows you to interact with it via a chat interface just like any of the other yeah. things with chat interfaces but that it's designed around a concept called not or around a model that's called not a large language model but a large they're calling it a large action model and others are talking about large action models too. And the premise of a large action model is they're designed to autonomously complete tasks in a way that large language models don't currently allow. Right. Um, Which is the whole agent thing, right? Right. And that's the idea of the agent versus an assistant is you kind of set it free and like, you know, you know, you might be like, look, you know, I want you to monitor Expedia. And when, you know, the room price at this hotel falls below a hundred. 50 bucks a night just book me three nights um and it'll take care of that end to end right if you were to do that with chat gpt chat gpt through plugins or whatever can monitor expedia i suppose right and let you know if the room has fallen below your price mm. but it can only do that in response to your ask. And it's not going to actually book the room for you. It'll tell you it's, you know, it'll give you a prompt to book the room. Right. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's a premise about, you know, agents, I guess, bring up this premise that these tools are going to be more useful than just chatbots. Um, but that doesn't mean you have to embed them into devices. And I think part of the rat, whatever the company that built rabbit is, I can't think of the name of the company. Um, they seem to be arguing that, um, that, you know, that a phone will never be able to run a large action model. Um, but I don't, I, see, I don't see why that would be true as if phone technology will never advance. And I don't see why, even if a phone can't run it today, why can, I mean, certainly I can't imagine that you couldn't run it on an echo, right? <laughs> No, I mean, it would almost be better if they had made the argument that this is a companion to a phone when you don't want your phone, right? Like, you know, this one of the things that we saw that came out of CES, which I thought was interesting, one of the trends that's not directly AI related, was off the grid, right? Electronics have worked off the grid so that you can use them without necessarily getting, you know, cookied or bugged or disturbed. Right. Basically, if you wanted to be mindful, but at the same time, still be able to uh, right. find a, a trail or a map or where's the nearest gas station or, uh, you know, look something up, whatever it might be, something that allowed you to not be in front of a screen per se, engaged in the world of the internet and getting uh, Tyler Perry videos sent to you or whatever, you yeah. know, I mean, like pick your poison. So, to me, the rabbit argument would have been better made like, hey, this is a personal assistant for you when you want to be off the grid uh, so that you can access information and get data without necessarily having to scroll or 
get sucked into social media or uh, the news, whatever it might be. And so, again, this is just back to the product marketing issue, I think. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely a problematic product. I think conceptually, the idea of of models that can act on your behalf, of course, is that's sound, right? I mean, that's yeah. coming. Um, yeah. But I wouldn't think to embed it in a standalone device, especially when you think about everything we've spoken about so far on the show is about putting AI into all of the other devices you're already living and working with, right? So now this is an outlier approach. And I don't know that I see a scenario in which in the near term, an AI device replaces a traditional mobile device. So right. to me, you're just working against the, you know, you're working against you're swimming upstream, and, right? And consumer behavior. Who's asking right. for this? Why don't we take a quick break before we move on to the fourth trend? Um, and uh, we'll be back in just a minute. Okay, we're back. We have one more trend, which is, uh, and we've talked about it quite a bit already, but consumer technology is going to drive AI to the edge. A AI is going to be omnipresent, whether it's in your kitchen, which I actually think is going to be awesome. I did reference earlier a barbecue that had AI. I think it was like $5,000. A lot of money. I said, and I saw something else about birding binoculars, also $5,000. <laughs> yeah, and I that was on that, see that story, right? Out there, right? And that's a great narrow use case, right? You know, a yes. pair of binoculars that can recognize a bird species. It's got the Merlin uh, catalog in there, right? But, but the price point, wow. Price point. Like, and that's, you know, that's the problem we see with so many new technologies, even for that matter, electric, electric vehicles, vehicles, right? Right, you yeah. Know, why are these so expensive? Do you need to really recoup your money in the first 12 months of sales? Come on. Look, people. I hate burned chicken like any other person, but I don't want to pay $5,000 for Always yeah. right, always on point chicken, man. <laughs> and, just, and, just, and just to be clear, the burnt chicken references the AI grill, not the AI birding binoculars. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, my binoculars cooked the chicken. Anyway. Um, right. But yeah, yeah. also you reference the talking toilet, right? The Kohler toilet that has AI embedded into it. You can control it with your voice. I, I don't know to what extent the intention is to chat with your toilet while you're sitting on it, but I do Boy. know the idea is it will be voice controlled instead Talk of- Talk about a privileged right? product, man. That's I know, just exactly. crazy, that's probably, right? That's probably, like, come probably, on. Like, what, what is that for? It's $4,000, right? Oh. Um, but we are seeing, I think, something more broadly that you touched on here right which is the idea that you know so far when we think about large language models we think about generative ai they are so massive that they are centralized running on these massive server farms sucking right. up tons of energy very expensive to build to maintain and for anyone that's using the apis to kind of write to and use right because it's mm -hmm. very expensive to 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 query the ai um it's you know, is that, you know, we're starting to see some hints, and we talked about this even on the last show of 2023. What was that? that? There will be a... Was that with Jeremiah? <laughs> that was with Jeremiah. You should listen to it, folks. He was a bullfrog. Um, <laughs> he wasn't a bullfrog. That's just a terrible... There was, a, t there was a, t a, t a tinge of echo on that one. There, there that was. One was. There was not our audio, best audio production. Not our yeah. best audio production. But hey, it was the end of the year. We were hitting the eggnog and... <laughs> um, but but anyway, um, you know, I spoke about the idea of, of um, small language models, right? This notion that... AI would become increasingly use case focused so that you wouldn't necessarily need a general all purpose model trained on trillions and trillions of, of, of um, pieces. Every article on earth, right? right? But that instead, if your sole focus for an AI system is to keep a griller from burning chicken, right? Obviously, there's other kinds of sophisticated artificial intelligence involved there beyond just generative AI. But your data uh, set's going to be pretty specific your data to cooking, set specific. right? The same yeah. is true. Like Walmart announced an assistant that will be resident. They're building it for iOS. So right, on the your shopping iPhone, assistant, right? Right. Where instead of saying you want, you know, like I want to buy nachos and I want to buy cheese and I want to buy jalapenos and I want to buy ground beef, let's say. 
you would instead say, you know, hey, Walmart, what do I need to buy for a Super Bowl party? Right. And you'll say, hey, you should serve nachos. and It'll give you an ingredient list and guide you around the store. Right. And one thing I even liked about that particular announcement was that uh, part of the use case was that you could share your list with your friends that are going to attend your party. What do you guys think? This is what I think we should get. Right. Dude, you missed the wigs. Where are the wigs? You know, like that kind right. of thing, which is great. Like that right. shareability really makes shopping more of a real experience. I mean, like you and I both have families. I'm pretty sure that you do some independent shopping just by divide and conquer with kids and all that stuff. How many times have I had to text my wife and just be like, Caitlin, uh, I got the milk. Is there anything else we need? Right. Or vice versa. Right. I mean, it's just the way it is. This is yeah. very helpful. Absolutely. And, and being able to do that conversationally like this. I mean, I can't think of the number of times when, you know, we're, we're hosting a holiday and I'm sitting like an, either on my phone in the notes app or like a loser with a piece of paper and a pen trying to remember every ingredient we need and then walking around the store with my list of ingredients. Right. And, um, you know, and I think that's a fairly common experience right you know, the idea of being able to say i'm making lasagna what do i need and getting a list of ingredients without Don't having the to, ricotta right <laughs> without having to remember ricotta and this and that and that right and that, right it is is useful right and that's you know kind of goes back to I feel like a theme that we've been hitting on through the entire show and you said it explicitly earlier in the show is what well, how can we use artificial intelligence to create value for customers? Um, because at the end of the day, the flash, the whiz, the bang, the fireworks, the, you know, the underlying technology is fundamentally unimportant to the average user. And I the think you shine is off, right? And you from- look at a lot, right. And you look at a lot of this stuff and you're like, who is asking for that? That's the question, right? And that's the question that that's I a think, normal CES question, dude. <laughs> right? right? And I mean, and I know CES is part showmanship, right? You know, yeah. it, that's part of what people go. And for. some of it's concept vehicles, right? right? So exactly. To speak. And to be clear, I mean, I, we should probably have said this earlier on, and we should confess to it now. We were not physically at CES. We were monitoring the news from afar. Uh, we could probably have faked it and pretended as if we were there. But hey, I'm all Deep about. Fake. Authenticity, uh, but you know when you and I've been to CES. You've been to CES. Yeah. I've been there for clients. I've been there as a. Marketer. I don't want to go to CES unless I get paid a right. lot of money. Yeah, and you know it's 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 a circus, right? And totally, and it's like going to South by Southwest, same right? Thing. And that's and that's what you're there for. And if you if you went and you didn't see a talking toilet in 2024, it's like we're <laughs> there. Come next year, right? <laughs> And, you know, that's, you know, that's just the reality of the show. But beyond the show, you got to get down to brass tacks, right? And if you're a marketer, um, you know, let's, let's give marketers credit for the fourth P or the first P or whatever you want to think of it is. But as long as you consider product part of the four P's, you know, as a marketer, when you're thinking about ways to integrate artificial intelligence or any technology. It could be metaverse. It could be augmented reality. It could be whatever. But when you're looking at integrating artificial intelligence into your product or service, the first question you have to ask is, how does this make my customer's life better? And if you're a marketer looking to use AI as something as something that you kind of bake into, embed into your campaign, Certainly, you're looking for ways like, how does it make me more efficient? How does it make my campaign more cost effective? How does it save me or my agency work and time and money? And you've got all that stuff going on. Right, right, right. At the same but that, time. But that's sausage making, right? Right. Like, like the same, exactly. You still have to absolutely be asking the question is, you know, is, is this a way to better engage my customer? Is this a way to create value for my co- my consumer, my prospect, my customer? Because if the answer is no, then all you're doing is putting a barrier to success in the way of your marketing program. Two points on this too. Uh, like the whole ethics conversation about how AI is used is important, but I don't think customers care anymore. And I think we're seeing that a little bit other than they're, that they're protected and that you say they're protected and then they'll be extremely outraged if they're not. 
right? If something right. bad happens, so I'm right? But I do think we've got to that point where the alarm over AI is starting to recede because people just don't care. I literally had a conversation. I think it was on uh, uh, our friend uh, Mr. Berkowitz's AI Guild. I attended last week, and uh, the Marketing Guild folks check it out. It's really cool. But uh, the guys were on there talking, and one guy said, "Like, look, I." I'm a vendor. He was with a very large company. I, I mean, I, I'm a I'm a marketer, a buyer. And when anybody comes to me and says, hey, I've got an AI, I just delete. I don't care. What are you going to do for me, right? Like, what does this do? I assume that you're using AI. People assume you're using AI. And I think that's really important to note. Like, everybody's getting very bent out of shape about disclosing whether or not they're using AI in their marketing content, you know, on their website. I, people don't care. I, I think that we actually have hit a point where people are assuming that companies are using AI on their sites and in their business operations in general. And so like this, this whole conversation to me needs to be focused about protecting consumers, protecting customer data making sure we're meeting regulatory needs with AI so that we're not uh, getting ourselves in trouble, uh, not just with our customers, but with the government, with law, the whole nine yards there. That's where that conversation needs to be focused. So that one's done. I, I just feel like we're going to see that one recede, and I know people are going to be angry about that, me just saying it doesn't matter that you have to disclose everything. I disagree. I, I just I, I just think it's hit the point where you're making mountains out of molehills. Uh, Number two is that AI as a shiny object, which we've discussed ad infinitum here on this show, it's dead. Nobody cares. You know, get down to what you're doing for me. And if your only announcement is that you have AI now, don't announce it. I, I don't think there's any value. All right, yeah, I'm done. Ran yeah, over. I mean, I think, you know, <laughs> and I think, you know, kind of riffing on the two things that you're talking about um, there, you know, I think that there is, I don't know that I agree a hundred percent with you that brands shouldn't be open and honest and upfront about the way they use AI and when they're using AI to interact with customers. Um, I agree with you that it might be more of a shoulder shrug now for the average consumer that they are making an assumption you're using artificial intelligence in some way. Uh, but I do think that there is a a risk of brands, I would say, uh, alienating customers who expect human interaction and authenticity when they hide the reality of the ways in which they're using AI potentially. That's one thing. Um, I, I don't disagree with you, but I think it's a disclosure in the sense of like a very basic, like, Hey, if you'd like to speak to a human, click here. Right, 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 right. I mean, I'm not saying you have to necessarily, you don't have to hammer it, right? But right, it's not something some... where you have to make a big molehill. Right. I'm, I'm right. out and out of it. it it's right. literally just like almost in some cases is as benign as a credit card disclosure, right? right? Like all the APR will move up depending on right. the Fed rates. I mean, sure. Like you may be at that point with this now. You know, and the other thing I'll say is that it does not, you know, and, and I and I know you weren't saying this, but this does not abdicate brands' responsibility for being responsible with their use of AI. And that's really where things go wrong. And that's where I think the marketer's focus needs to be is on how do we define responsibility? And what does that look like? And how do we protect the brand, of course, right? We need to know that what we're doing is brand safe. It's not right. putting our company or our employees at risk. And our customers. Also, exactly. Yeah. That's the next and, and This is data critical. governance, though, right? Like right. This, this conversation, to me, is a data governance conversation and not an AI ethics conversation. It, I mean, it, 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 they're hand in hand, yeah, it is but it's broader. a data gap. It's yeah. data governance. I mean, it's cybersecurity. Right. It's broader. Exactly. It's broader than just AI. Um, there's an element of it that is AI specific, which I think is not using artificial intelligence in a way that it's, it's exploitative. The consumer yeah. that's exploitative that puts the consumer at risk explicitly that manipulates the consumer in a way that has not been feasible before. But 
But that's also an old issue of somewhat thanks to social media. Right. Right. Social networks. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's not new news, but I mean, we know for a fact because we've this been there, we've it. seen there that we've done it. Um, and we've sometimes, frankly, I feel have been on the wrong side of history with this is that we went through the <laughs> entire sort of hype cycle of social media, the web 2.0 days without ever really thinking about that. <laughs> um, it, this is a time to think through it. Yeah. And, and and I almost hope, like, the government actually gets it right from a regulatory standpoint. I, I, I have major doubts about that. But, yeah. you know, I don't this know what's is where... Happen there, but that's, and that's another thing, right? That's an, yeah. kind of going in, like, all different directions here. But when you think, as you're, if you're a brand, right, and you're a global brand, right, you have different regulatory requirements in Europe now than you have in the United States. And then even within the United States, by mid-2024, both California and Colorado are going to have AI regulation that the rest of the country, as far as I know, will not have. I don't know exactly what the specifics of those regulatory things are, but they are regulating AI in their states. And that's going to have implications in terms of how, as a brand, you can use AI to engage with a consumer, use data to, um, you know, to, to target, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, like, there's a lot of complexity as a brand that you're going to need to manage to ensure that you don't get on the wrong side of the law. I see you by the I see you talking, Jeff. I'm not getting audio. Oh man, I muted. Sorry. Right. Little little cough mic there. Um I was gonna say like one of the things that uh, since we're all over the place with this pod already uh, at the end here, it's like a pickleball thing. You know, the ball's over the court, it's over the fence. Uh, it's crazy. But the thing is is with the EU regulation, you could see that we've basically ceded all intellectual property governance. To Europe, I mean, we did this already with the the privacy, right? Um, GDPR, yeah, GDPR, and now we're doing it with uh, intellectual property. And that's because of our own issues as a political country. But you know, I don't even want to get into that. But to me, it's a travesty. You know, we've basically just resigned. We don't care. We'll let California do it, and then just scream about it. We'll let Europe do it. We'll just scream about it. But we we basically don't have the uh, motivation or leadership to do it anymore. Unfortunately, yeah. that very well may be the case. And I think that gets down, you know, again, to kind of maybe bring it in a little bit is if you're a brand, you need to kind of take the mantle on yourself. No one is going to protect you. No one is going to, you know, you know, no one's going to give you the the rules by which to play this game. Uh, at some point, you'll be held accountable to regulation in certain regions of the world or even certain states of the nation. Uh, at some point, you might face consumer backlash or employee backlash or whatever based on the choices you make. Right. And ultimately, at the end of the day, no one's going to save you. It is up to you. Open AI is not going to protect you. Microsoft is not going to protect you. Even if they Open AI is... Definitely not yeah. going to protect like, you. Even if they say they're, going, <laughs> you're right. even if they say they're indemnifying you against this or that or whatever, at the end of the day, when there's an issue with your um, application of AI, it, people are going to blame you. Point right at you. Right? You Whether might be able to get your AI vendor in the aftermath when everything's over, and you're yeah. you're suing people. But by that point, your business is dead if right. you're at that if yeah. you're at that level of an issue, right? Yeah. So 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 if there's anything, this has nothing to do with the topic of the show whatsoever. But you know, we you know, come around to this idea of you know you're Gary responsible. Shapiro is rolling. You're around responsible like, for you. But I guess where it came from is that you know Gary it's sort of this idea. It was it's sort of. Yes, yeah. I think hey, we're, <laughs> uh, you know, I think, I guess, if anything, bringing it back to the CES topic was we were talking about, you know, Viva Las Vegas. No, we were talking <laughs> about the, um, the importance of, you know, as a, as a marketer, 
not always, leaning on AI as your selling point. Right? right. And always asking the question, how is this, not just how is this good for me? I get press, but how Look, is it good yeah, for my Get company? out of your, 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 your glass, right? See yeah. the outside world. I think this is one of the larger issues with AI in general, though, with the hype cycle. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Yeah, with the hype cycle. I think, are we done yammering on? I thought we were going to have a nice short show. We've hit 50 something minutes now. Brainer, um, no brainer. What's your brainer? Right. Oh, we already did it. Never mind. <laughs> I feel like kidding. we kind of did it, but I, I, you know, I, I would say, I mean, the brainer here to me clearly is, um, is, uh, you know, maybe I'm going to go in a different direction, actually, is that it's don't believe your own hype. <laughs> <laughs> is the brainer right? I think Very we have a lot of, of you, man. We have a lot of companies right now that are coming out of CES and they're high on their own supply. And you know, mm. you need to be sure that you're not getting so swept up in your own hype and just adding to the noise, the chaos, the confusion, and the mess that's out there in terms of all of the you know AI frothiness. Um, that, you know, just kind of settle down, be smart, be strategic, and recognize that if this is not adding value across the board, most especially to your customers, then you need to really kind of tone it down and rethink the way you're integrating AI into your strategy. And I think the no-brainer for me is that AI is becoming a part of everything. And if you're not making it part of everything already, then you should be. That should be pretty obvious at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Let's let's uh, let's wrap it up. All right. Thanks, everybody. Here we go. Yeah, we really appreciate you coming on by, and thank you for allowing Greg and I to have a good coffee chat the last twenty minutes. But you know, this is what happens when you get two geeks in a room, man. We start, we really start uh, jiving on this stuff, and uh, and we really enjoy talking about. We're glad you're still here if you're listening. Please like us on YouTube. Uh, Spotify, iTunes, or I guess it's called Apple Podcasts or whatever they call it this year. Um, talk about branding issues. Changed the name too many times. But, you know, wherever you listen, please like us. Please share with your friends. Do send us some feedback. We do appreciate it. Uh, we did hear some feedback a little bit on the audio last time, and we've uh, made some small changes to address that. Um, but in general, we want to hear from you. We want to hear your topics, and we want to be useful. So please uh, make sure to find us on uh, uh, nobrainerpodcast.com or via Cognitive Path.